I want you to think about this. If you went to church every Sunday for the next 40 years, okay, every Sunday, you would spend around 3,000 hours in church. But if during that same time you worked a full-time job, you'd put in around 80,000 hours in the workplace. Okay, 3,000 hours in church, 80,000 hours in the workplace. Here's what that reveals. The workplace, not the sanctuary, is the primary context where you will live out your faith. And based on that, I want to make one simple but powerful point to you all today. And it's really more pastoral than theological. One point, that your work matters to God. He cares about it. Your work matters to God. And I want to drive that one simple point home because I think deep down, we resist that. Even if you don't do it at a conscious level, deep down, I think people often resist that idea. And so what I want to do is I want to address a few reasons why people think their work might not matter to God. The first one, and probably the most obvious, is that someone might think my work doesn't matter to God because it's not a church job. It's not church work. And this is one of the most common and yet devastating myths that's out there. It's prevalent in the church that the people who love God the most work for the church, and they will do their work in the church as a pastor or as a missionary or something like that. But it couldn't be further from the truth. If you look at the scriptures, it's clear that we were made for work, and God values all kinds of work. That's why when you read through the narrative of the Bible, you see that Joseph was in politics, Daniel was a student, Boaz was a businessman, Lydia was a designer, Jesus was a carpenter. Think about when Israel was in exile and God wanted to bring them back to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. How would God rebuild a city? What kind of team would he put together to do this great work of rebuilding Jerusalem? Would it just be a group of priests? No, God puts together three key leaders. Nehemiah is a civil engineer, Zerubbabel is a politician, and Ezra is the priest. It's all three of those working together that God uses to restore a city. And so your work matters to God. Now, a second reason why some of you think that your work doesn't matter to God is that you've been told over and over and over and over again by people that what you do is not a real job. Okay, now this is L.A., So we've got a lot of creatives, a lot of artists. I mean, Los Angeles really is the epicenter for producing culture, for creativity throughout the world. And so a lot of people come to Los Angeles looking for creative jobs and being in artistic industries. And I've been a pastor in Los Angeles long enough to know that a lot of those same people have their parents back home, wherever that is, Uh, asking them, are you going to get a real job yet? They see what you're doing in music or in art or in writing. They, They see it as a phase that they hope eventually you'll grow out of so that you can get a job that's more consistent and steady and pays the bills more regularly. And so people who are in artistic industries, like many of you are here in Los Angeles, are constantly feeling this pressure and, 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 and a lack of dignity in the work that they do. But uh, to, that, to that question, the question of the worth of artistic work, I would, I would point to the scriptures and ask a question. Who's the, who's the first person in the Bible that's said to be filled with the Spirit of God? Is it a priest? Is it a preacher? No. The first person in the scriptures that's said to be filled with the Spirit of God is Bezalel. Bezalel was the chief artisan in designing the tabernacle. He was the one overseeing the beauty and design, the artwork that's on the tabernacle. And God fills him with his spirit so that he might do that to the fullness of his ability, beyond his ability, and to the glory of God. And so if you're here in Los Angeles, you're an an artist, you're creative, and you've been hearing people asking you, when are you going to get a real job for a long time? I want you to hear it loud and clear. Your work matters to God. We believe in a creative God who reveals the beauty and glory of himself and his creation through the creativity of his people. Now, the third and last reason that you might not think your work matters to God 
uh, doesn't come from your parents. Maybe this comes from you. It comes from a mentality of, well, what I'm doing right now isn't my dream job. And so it's this idea that someday I've got this vision that I'm going to do this great thing. I'm going to start a nonprofit. I'm going to uh, create something that's meaningful and that impacts the world in a good way. And I'm going to enjoy it and thrive off of that. And you think, someday I'm going to be doing that. And when that happens, my, my work will matter to God. But right now it doesn't. And you kind of sense this if you ask someone the question in Los Angeles, Uh, what do you do for work? You you know, that's a complicated question to ask in Los Angeles. What do you do for work? Because what happens so often is you ask someone, what do you do for work? And and it's, well, uh, do you mean like, what did I come to LA to do? What am I made for? Or what pays the bills? (laughs) And sometimes those two things aren't always the same thing, right? That maybe what what you really love and what you aspire to and what you want to do is, is, you want to be an actor, you want to be a writer, you want to be an engineer, you want to do something else, but right now you're driving for Uber, or you're a barista, or you're working in a restaurant. And there's a tendency to look at that and say, well, this menial work that I'm doing right now, that doesn't matter to God, of course. But someday when I accomplish something great, that will matter to God. But I would want to push back on that mentality. I don't want you just to think God cares about your work when you arrive at your dream job. He cares about it all, and he wants you to be faithful with it all. So yes, strive to do what you love, but also don't discount the work that you're doing in the meantime. I mean, listen, if, if you get to get paid for something that you love, you're one of the luckiest people in the history of the world. I mean, literally. If you get to do something that you enjoy and, and that, that you get a lot out of personally, that's amazing. Use all the influence that you can in that for good. But if you're doing something that's difficult that you're not crazy about, know that God, God cares about that too. If you're an Uber driver, you can, make a, you can make or break someone's day. If you're working at a restaurant, you get to show the true beauty of service in a culture that's self-serving. And so I want you to hear it loud and clear. Your work matters to God. And when you believe that God cares about your work, then you'll start to care about your work the same way that he does. In other words, people will want to be lawyers not because they care about social status, but because they care about justice. People will want to be doctors not because they care about wealth, but because they care about health. People who want to be businessmen and businesswomen, not because they're looking for profit, but because they want to love people. People will be artists, not because they're trying to be a celebrity, but because they value beauty. They want to show God's beauty to the world. Proverbs 11.10 says, When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Think about that in terms of work. What if all the Christians in Los Angeles prospered in their work? What if every single Christian in Los Angeles was absolutely successful in what they were setting out to do? Would the city rejoice? Would it better the city? Or would the city be bummed because it just means that the Christians are better off and no one else is? When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. And let's apply that to this city that we're in the heart of right now. Jesus loves Los Angeles. And Jesus is doing an incredible work throughout this city right now. I get a front row seat at that, not only in my church, but to hear in other churches all over the city how Jesus is changing lives. He's bringing people into a family. He's giving us a purpose bigger than ourselves. Jesus is doing an incredible work throughout Los Angeles, but I believe he's gonna do an even greater work. And one of the ways that he's going to do that is through people who know that their work matters to God. And the church is meant to be a city on a hill. But let's remember that the church is not defined by a Sunday morning gathering. No, we're scattered throughout this city city, in the areas that we work and play and eat. When people find out I'm a pastor, one of the first questions that they ask me is, oh, where's your church? And I know what they're asking. I know they're saying, where's your church building? But here's how I like to often answer the question when people say, where's your church? I like to say, you know, let's say it's like a a Tuesday afternoon. They'll say, where's your church? I'll say, "Uh, right now in a coffee shop in Silver Lake, in a studio in the Valley, in in City Hall downtown, in a tech office on the west side. 
that the church, we are the people of God who, yeah, we gather on Sundays to exalt Christ, but we are sent out throughout the week into the mission fields of our workplaces called to be salt and light to this city. And one of the most practical ways that you will show your love to this city is through your vocation, a calling from God, not just an occupation that takes up your time, not a career so you can build your kingdom, a vocation, a calling from God to use your gifts and your abilities to serve and better those around you. And so what we need in Los Angeles is we need Christians who are actors and nurses and engineers and musicians and lawyers and electricians and plumbers and writers and police officers and on and on and on and on. And I want you to notice there that I didn't say we need Christian artists or Christian electricians. I said we need Christians who do those things. I, I like to remind people that Christian uh, is a better noun than it is adjective. Okay, there's, there's no such thing as Christian coffee. <laughs> Even if it's sold in a place called Grounded in Christ or Being Redeemed, okay? <laughs> there's no such thing as Christian coffee. There are Christians, and some make good coffee, and some make bad coffee, okay? And the same is true for filmmakers, musicians, nurses, dentists, and so on. And so if you have put your faith in Christ, you are a Christian, and you are called to be a good steward of whatever the Lord has trusted entrusted to you vocationally, whether that's in a coffee shop or in a studio or in a church building or on the street, whatever that is, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. That's what God's word says in Colossians 3. I, I'll close with this. I think that one of the most practical ways, well, Jesus tells us that we are to love God and to love our neighbor. And the most practical way that you will love your neighbor is by loving people that you work with and through, and through your vocation. And I mean that both uh, personally, like individually and corporately in terms of uh, how you treat people one-on-one -on -one in, work, in a workspace environment or how you're the, 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 a corporation that you're with or uh, a bigger organization that you're with, how that contributes to the city. And who better to learn from about loving our neighbor than Fred Rogers? Right? Some of you saw the movie about Mr. Rogers, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And what a lot of people uh, didn't know about Fred Rogers is that he was an ordained minister. But he was commissioned by his church not to minister from the pulpit, but to minister in the studio. And Mr. Rogers had a very serious, deep understanding of his calling from God. And if you hear him talk about and the purpose of his show, it, it could be easy to look back at Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and think, oh, a kid's show, how cute, they do all these cute little things, and that's just kind of entertainment. No, if you heard Fred Rogers talk about his show, it was very deep. He believed that children should be shown dignity, that they should be treated with respect and drawn into important conversations. He would say, I don't need to dress up like a clown and give kids candy to get their attention. And so on his show, he would talk about serious topics of things that were going on culturally. And during the 60s, this was a very tense time in our country and even internationally. This was during the Vietnam War. Racial segregation was, was very intense. And so Mr. Rogers did something that was quite countercultural. He had Francois Clemens, who's an African-American man, play a police officer on the show. I believe he was the first African-American uh, uh, regular role on a TV show. And Mr. Rogers used the space that he had to bring him into that. So that in and of itself was an incredible thing. But what was happening one year especially was uh, ra the racial segregation was heating up. It was getting more and more, in more intense. And the, the local public pools were a battleground for racial segregation. And so you can see videos back in the 60s of, of a hotel owner going out and pouring acid over African Americans who were swimming in his pool. It was that intense. And so one day on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Francois Clemens, the African American police officer, comes to the door and he welcomes him in and says, wow, it sure is a, a warm day out. What do you say we, we go outside and get in the pool? And they go outside, they have a little kiddie pool with about you know, six inches of water. They both sit down, take their shoes off, 
and put their feet in the pool together. A white man and a black man on national TV in the midst of all of this tension, showing this is what it looks like to love your neighbor. And so that was Fred Rogers' calling. That was his way of serving. And he knew that his work mattered to God. Even if people wrote it off as a kid's show, even if people said, well, you're not working in the church, he knew it. And so I hope you know that. And I want to say this to you pastorally. I'm, I'm not all of your pastors. Some of you here are from my church. Uh, but I want to say this to you pastorally. Your work matters to God. And your work matters to the church. And I simply want to close by praying for you and asking God's favor and blessing on your work and that he would use you as salt and light in this city. Let's pray together. God, thank you for every single person here that you are their maker and that you have gifted them and called them in specific and unique ways to contribute to the good work that you are doing in this city. God, I pray that your light would shine through them in the workplaces that you've called them to. I pray that they would be like salt, preserving what's good in your creation and enhancing it, Lord, in this city. God, we know that you love Los Angeles more than all of us combined. And would you draw us into showing your love in the way that we do our work? I pray ultimately, Lord, that every person here would know that their work matters greatly to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.